I uh, want to thank UTSA for hosting us today. Uh, it's great to be here on this campus and uh, thank uh, uh, President uh, uh, Ricardo Romo. Thank you very much for hosting us. I uh, also want to thank Bert Marshall with Blue Cross Blue Shield and others who helped make this event possible. Uh, Albert Carsales, Elvira Yaquez, and uh, James Borrego. Thank you very much for all your help with this. Uh, we have one more event in this health series we're doing with Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's on November 1st at Rice University at the Baker Institute. So if you're ready for a road trip, please join us over there. Uh, also, all of our events, including the August 27th health event we did, today's event, and the Baker Institute one, will be, the video will be available online on our site, texastribune.org, in the next day or so. So if you missed anything or want to go back and review, uh, check there. Uh, if you uh, enjoy events like this, please consider joining us in Austin at the end of the month for the Texas Tribune Festival. Uh, this is uh, what we call Woodstock for Wonks. So uh, it's nine tracks, three days, uh, about 150 speakers, as well as uh, walking tours of the Watergate Papers at the Ransom Center, the Texas State Cemetery, uh, and even uh, maybe a UT marching band uh, making an appearance. So uh, tickets uh, for that are available. The prices go up tomorrow. Uh, so if you want to get your tickets, today is a good day for it. It's $160 now. Tomorrow goes up to $195. Uh, speaking of joining the Tribune, if you're not a member of the Texas Tribune, please see Natalie Choate at the table out in the lobby. She'll be glad to tell you all about us. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan news organization, and we rely on members like you to make events like this possible. Uh, other things are, uh, if you have a, your cell phones, please make sure they're on silent so uh, your uh, folks calling you don't disrupt the program. But if you are tweeting or uh, uh, taking pictures, please use the hashtag TribLive for this. We'd love to do that and get people out here to, to see what we're doing. Uh, the format today is we're going to have about have one hour of discussion that Becca will moderate, and then 15 to 20 minutes of questions from the audience at the end. So uh, with all that done, uh, I'd like to turn over to Becca Aronson, my colleague at the Tribune, who's moderating today's panel. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today, and I hope to see you later this month at our festival. Um, today we're going to be talking about the future of Latino healthcare. Um, as you probably know, within the next decade, Texas is likely to become a majority Hispanic state, um, and already 50% of our youth are Hispanic. So this is going to be have a really big impact on healthcare. And here to talk with us um, today are Dr. Esteban Lopez, the regional president of uh, the San Antonio region for Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, he oversees 310,000 members and um, is dual certified in internal medicine and pediatrics. We also have Dr. Amelie Ramirez. Uh, she is a professor and director of the Institute for Health Promotion Research at the UT Health Science Center here in San Antonio. She has 30 years of, experiencing, <laughs> of experience researching um, Latino health care, such as um, genetic predispositions to cancer and PC prevention. And also we have Democratic State Senator Leticia Vanapute, who has two decades of experience serving in our state legislature and is also a pharmacist here in San Antonio. Um, so before we talk about the future, let's start with the present. Um, what are some of the health disparities that particularly affect the Latino community now? Um, and you know, why are these problems more prevalent within this community? So, uh, actually, I'd like to address that. Rebecca. Um, we just completed a study um, with, through our Institute for Health Promotion Research looking at the 38 counties in South Texas. And the two top uh, concerns that we have are obesity and diabetes. And South Texas rates were higher than the rest of Texas and higher than the nation. So these are, this is a reflection, and as you well know, the further south we go, the larger the Hispanic population. And one of the things I'm concerned about that oftentimes not all Latino populations are represented in some of the data that we have available nationally, but at the same time, I keep reminding people that two-thirds of that population are Mexican-American. So these are some things that we really need to, to be looking at and become and uh, developing programs that really began to address this issue. And recently there was a study out what makes a city healthy. And it's having more green spaces, it's really encouraging activities for, for families to be involved, getting the community uh, and healthcare community involved in creating these kinds of changes. Then we also have unique cancers that are impacting our population, such as cervical cancer, but then we have liver, stomach, and gallbladder cancers 
Well, we don't have really good treatments available for those, and those are on the rise. Again, they're higher in South Texas compared to Texas and compared to the nation. So these are things that are all related to, to obesity as well, and so that we really make, need to take a more concerted effort in that area. Yeah, Dr. Lopez, do you see similar things within this community? Well, absolutely, and uh, I'm so <coughs> pleased to be here on the west side of San Antonio. I started my career 10 years ago uh, down the street at the Texas Diabetes Institute. And uh, of course, in that practice that I had uh, 10 years ago, we saw a disproportionate amount of comorbidities with folks uh, with diabetes. Uh, and it's, it's true today that uh, the comorbidities and the death rate within the Latino population are, are disproportionate from the non-Latino population, or specifically the Anglo population, uh, in the state of Texas and across the country. And to Dr. Aramides' point, two-thirds of uh, Latinos in the nation are of Mexican descent. And so specifically here in South Texas, we have uh, to focus on, on the needs of this population to be able to close that gap with uh, disproportionate uh, comorbidity and death, specifically with regards to diabetes, specifically with regards to obesity and the, the various cancers. Even though the overall cancer rate among Latinos is low, um, we want to continue that positive trend, but we're seeing some uh, very disturbing trends with regards to obesity-related obesity cancers. So why is obesity and diabetes, why are these diseases more prevalent in Latino communities than other demographics? Well, one of the things that we're seeing is really low, lower socioeconomic levels, uh, less access to health insurance, less access to preventive care, uh, and lower education. And we find that individuals who tend to have a lower education, less than high school, are more likely to be obese nationwide. And this is recently in a report that came out on, uh, in obesity. And so these are kinds of environmental areas that where we need to change. And we need to really think more proactively as how can our communities create you know, more walking spaces, more parks and recreations for our kids to come out and play. Well, I think what I'm most alarmed at is how public policy and uh, the lack of insurance really increases uh, those mortality numbers and particularly the morbidity, the, the bad outcomes. When Latinos are the highest uh, group with no insurance, uh, that preventative care, which is accessible in, for example, uh, non-Hispanic whites, that things would be taken care of early on are not available. And so while I understand the statistics, and yes, uh, it, it is diabetes, it is obesity, it is, uh, that is a, a very alarming problem. The fact that Latinas contract cervical cancer at twice the rate than non-Hispanic uh, white women is very alarming. And maybe there is that correlation, but I also know if you don't have any money to go get a, a, your yearly pap smear, if the state has cut off basic access to the women's health program, if you're on Medicaid, and we're one of the very few states that cuts off Medicaid 60 days postpartum, so that means 60 days after the birth of a baby, though that access is critical to help prevent some of those problems. So I don't want to just blame it on, on my folks, and I still practice pharmacy. I was working there yesterday at, at Davila Pharmacy, um, not too far away from here, uh, less than about three minutes from here. And I think it's wrong for us to blame a lifestyle or the diet and, and put that on the blame of the Latino population when, in fact, our main problems are poverty and lack of insurance. Yeah. I mean, so let's talk a little bit more about this lack of insurance. I mean, as many people know, Texas has the highest rate of uninsured in the nation, but among the Latino community, even though they're currently only about 40% of our population total, they're about 60% of our uninsured. So they do make up the largest demographic group of our uninsured. Um, can you guys also speak to what impact this has on their access to health services? If I may, uh, yes, yeah, 60% is a huge percentage of the uninsured, uh, 6.2 million uninsured in the state of Texas, and 60% of those folks are Latino. Um, that's why things like the Affordable Care Act play such an important role within the Latino community because the Latinos are the most benefit in terms of access to care at an affordable price. 
Uh, I think that's, if we're talking about the future, that's part of the solution of getting folks the care that they need. I still practice, and I practice in the emergency department, and I see so many Latino patients. I practice on uh, the southwest side of town at Southwest General, and I practice down in the Rio Grande Valley in Edinburgh, and the bulk of my patients are, are Latinos, and over and over I see folks that I may diagnose in the emergency department uh, and diagnose with a cancer or something similar and sending them home with no good follow up because they don't have insurance to get access to the oncologist and sometimes there's some challenges with the safety net within the communities that they live. Um, so the, the lack of insurance is part of the problem uh, but now with the Affordable Care Act and with implementation and open enrollment beginning October 1st, uh, it's an opportunity to, to deal with that issue and getting the information out to Latinos in our communities across the state is so important. The other thing is the Affordable Health Care Act is, is a wonderful opportunity, but we need to get our community enrolled. We need to educate them about what it is, what it's going to offer, and the importance of coming in for preventive screening. Because if you just mentioned, our population is used to more urgent care because they haven't had the insurance. So uh, we really need this concerted effort of public education, informing them of what it is and the importance of it, because they're, st they're still going to come in for that urgent care. And that, that's what they're used to, because, uh, you know, so it's going to take a while to change, and we need to start early. Yeah. I think one of the most disappointing policy decisions for our state uh, was the governor's decision not to uh, take advantage of the expansion of Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. On the low side, our state numbers uh, indicate about maybe 950,000 working adults would have been covered in that. On the high side, Kaiser tells us, Kaiser Permanente tells us that it's probably closer to 1.7 million working adults. Uh, what the Affordable Care Act did in its passage was saying that any adults uh, with a family of four under the 138th percentile of poverty, and people say, well, what does that mean? That means if you make $32,499 a year, there are so many Latino families that fit in that category, and they are working, that those folks would be covered uh, by a Medicaid expansion. And really, it's, it, it's a misnomer to say it's a Medicaid expansion. In fact, so many states are going to the private market uh, and, and enrolling those technical Medicaid expansion programs in, in the private market. What that decision did was very, very difficult under the Affordable Care Act, especially for Latinos who are working and who lack that health care insurance. It is going to be difficult for our Latino population who also are small business owners because of the passage of the Affordable Care Act. That was mandatory. States had to expand. The Supreme Court decision said uh, that gave the states the ability to say no. Texas, one of the few states uh, that is saying no to that at a real cost, I think, to the people and to the Latino population. You know, it's no surprise that 20 some odd chambers of commerce throughout the state wrote resolutions to the legislature in favor, our hospital association, and many of, of the groups, because they understand the economics of this. But what it means for Latino families is to have the security and of, of knowing that you would have the ability to have a family doctor. That decision leaves us in the hole and affects Latino families more than any other policy decision that the state could have taken is to deny that health care coverage for at least a million working adults, 60 some odd percent of those Latinos. And at a cost to the state, you know, Medicaid gives us a match rate. But this would have been, for every dollar the state puts in, $9 in federal funds. And that's after the first three years. The first three years, feds would pick it up uh, totally. So basically, our numbers were that the state could have spent $51 million to draw down $4 billion in health care. The majority of that would have gone to cover Latino working adults. Yeah. Um Actually, the Urban Institute, I think, had a study that showed 22% of Latinos won't be able to get health insurance under the Affordable Care Act because we didn't expand Medicaid. Um, you know, 
this goes back to how they're actually accessing care right now. Um, I mean, what are you seeing in the delivery of care to the Hispanic and Latino community um, now in terms of without insurance? How do they access care? In one of the places that they go <laughs> to the emergency departments where I see them, um, uh, emergency department's a great place to get life-saving care if you're having a heart attack or stroke or, or some type of event like that, but it's not a great place to get your diabetes managed or your hypertension managed or your, your cholesterol managed. Uh, why? Because you're going to see a different doctor every time. Uh, there's no good continuity of care. And so having access to a regular provider, and again, I, I'll come back to the Affordable Care Act, uh, for the folks that will qualify for the Affordable Care Act, and to Dr. Ramirez's point, getting the information out to them is so very important. One of the things that we're doing is we're, we have a grassroots campaign called We Cover Texas, and in Spanish it's Asegura Tu Salud. It's a way that we are, as an insurance company, getting information out in a non-biased fashion. We're not branding it uh, to the Blue Cross Blue Shield logo. It's going to benefit all insurers because we're going to get information out and they're going to pick the insurance that best meets their needs. So I think having uh, uh, public-private partnerships or private partnerships with community organizations, which we're doing uh, across the state, is so important in order to get the information out to the population. The other point I want to make is to Senator Vanderpeet's point, it's not just about diet and lifestyle. Because when we look at the tra traditional Latino diet, when we look at first immigrant, like my parents who came from Mexico, they tend to be healthier. Uh, and as they assimilate, uh, we start seeing the challenges with, with health. And so it, it really is as they start getting a more Western diet or Americanized diet, that we start seeing uh, those challenges with obesity uh, and things to that effect. But, uh, you know, my mother worked eight hours a day. She came home and cooked a full meal from scratch. Uh, I probably ate more burgers in, in a year than I ate in my entire childhood, um, or more pizza in a year than I ate in my entire childhood as an adult. Um, and that is one of the things we want to continue to foster. Some of the challenges that we face in the communities that we're in our food deserts, areas where they don't have access, uh, unsafe neighborhoods where they can't walk to a grocery store, neighborhoods without sidewalks, to Senator Vanderpeet's point earlier. And I think the, the issue is, is very complex. And as we look at the demographics of our, for instance, our physician community in the state, uh, we make up a, a, around 8.5% of the physicians in the state of Texas. We're 38% of the population. For the last 10 years, uh, uh, physicians have uh, accounted for 10 per, or medical students, 10% uh, of the medical students every year for the last 10 years have been Latino, and that's kept steady. So it really hasn't increased with the percentage of our population. I mean, and that, that's an important point, not having Hispanic doctors to care for Latino patients, because, um, you know, what are some of the cultural differences in the way that the Latino community approaches healthcare just in general that a westernized doctor might not understand when they're trying to communicate with that patient about you know, what's going on with their health? Yeah. One of the, the biggest problems, after, obviously, is the language barriers, you know, and just being feeling comfortable with a person who looks like them and who speaks their language, they're more likely to come and, and feel more comfortable there and to come back for repeated for repeated care. And right now our system is some, still somewhat frag, fragmented in, in that area. You know, we'll pull a nurse or we'll pull somebody else to help with translation services versus having more active um, translation services av available. But I wanted to go back to an earlier point. Um, when I see cancer patients come through our cancer centers, there's lots of gaps in their care. You know, and these are individuals with very um, devastating diseases, and sometimes they get care links, sometimes they don't, you know, and they're constantly in and out of what they qualify for. And so utilizing patient navigation services is something that we have found very effective in helping them stay connected so they can get consistent care. Because as soon as they you know, become unqualified for a type of health services, they've got to go through all the paperwork all over again. And helping, you know, having someone to help them navigate that system has become really critical. I think what's really different, uh, growing up in San Antonio and uh, on San Antonio's west side, um, I owned a pharmacy in, in San Antonio's West By, and I still work um, as a pharmacist, is understanding, I think, which is the biggest cultural difference, is that healthcare decisions for Latinos are, are not individually made. Mm -hmm. uh, they are made with the family. Uh, if you are talking uh, to, uh, like, Senor Rodriguez, one of my patients, and I just use that as an example, 
and you're visiting with him about the diabetes and compliance, unless you have Mrs. Rodriguez in the room, eh, it's not mm -hmm. going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, because she controls the household. She mm -hmm. controls what he eats. She, I mean, and, and I think that's a very big cultural difference. Uh, to give you an example, when I had a, a pharmacy, the pharmaceutical representatives would come in and, you know, it, I had doctor's offices and the waiting rooms were out and they, and they thought, oh my gosh, what great business uh, they're going to have. Because there'd be 35 people in the waiting rooms. There's only five patients. <laughs> See, but you understand when Granny, when when Melita goes to the doctor, I mean, it's the daughter-in-law, and, and they, it, you really have to understand because it's all about the conversation and about the prevention. And I think that having someone who not only understands the language uh, but understands the culture, you get much better outcomes. Uh, and unless you know that, that's why our Promotora programs mm -hmm. are so strong and are very effective. And that's why it's going to be very important in any rollout of the exchanges or the Affordable Care Act that the people that are actually giving the information understand who really makes the decisions in the household. Yeah. And I mean, to this point, you know, what can we do to change our healthcare system to both, you know, be more understanding of these kinds of cultural differences in a way that might improve it for everyone and improve it, you know, specifically for the Latino community in the way that they can access care. I mean, I can give you an example from our company, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, we hire uh, bilingual, bicultural uh, customer service advocates that work with individual members. We're hiring uh, bilingual, bicultural nurses. Uh, we have folks at all levels of, of the company, and we have initiatives in place specifically to address the needs of the Latino community, not just from a language issue, not just from uh, the pamphlets that we develop, but to how we um, may work with them over the phone, uh, making sure that the information is culturally relevant to the population that we're serving. And it might be culturally relevant in a way for South Texas. It may be a little bit different from how we manage folks in Illinois where there may be a larger uh, Puerto Rican population, for instance. Um, the health disparities aren't just Latino health disparities, but they're health disparities within our community. So, for instance, we may not have an issue with asthma uh, with Mexican Americans, but Puerto Ricans a huge percentage of, of Puerto Ricans have asthma and complications with that. So we need to address the, the various groups within our organization. And as an insurance company, we, we acknowledge that. We're doing research internally to uh, focus specifically on Latino uh, health. Um, you know, the fact that I'm here as a regional president in, in San Antonio is a testament to the fact that we're really wanting to address uh, Latinos in, in a way that's culturally relevant in this part of the state. I just wanted to support that, and we need to start it from the moment they enter into the clinic all the way through their last visit, and then the continuity of care, the referrals, the follow-ups that are needed. They, they need a, a lots of assistance throughout the, the process, because it's really intimidating if you're coming in with a very serious health problem in and, and terms of how to deal with that and how to, you know, and, and as uh, Senator Vandepute said, you know, you bring your family and everybody's listening to a different piece of it and helping in make the next decision for you. But we need to be really clear about what steps they need to take and then the follow-up care that they need as well. Yeah. And you, I mean, you kind of mentioned the Be Covered campaign. Many people do not understand the Affordable Care Act, whether you support it or you don't. It's a very complicated law right now. Um, and you know, come October, people are going to be trying to enroll and get health care. And I get questions all the time, where do I go, what do I do? Um, I mean, how are we really going to educate people on what options are available if right now all they know is to go to the emergency room if they don't have health insurance? I think, it, it, you know, the Be Covered campaign is a start. And having a consistent message from a reliable source is important. And that's why the Be Covered campaign is a grassroots organization that isn't coming from the top down, but really disseminating the information with organizations that are already uh, in those communities and are trusted sources. All we're doing is providing the information to those folks uh, so that they can provide it in, in a way that's culturally relevant and competent. Obviously, our campaign is going to be in English, is in English, and in Spanish. Uh, so it's very important, but when we have 42% of the population across the country that thinks that the Affordable Care Act was overturned, we have huge challenges. We have to start from, from uh, uh, zero. 89% uh, of Latinos want more information about the Affordable Care Act. 
we're here to provide that information. And uh, we are just one of many sources out there, but we want to be a, a Texas relevant source. And I think that's why uh, getting the information out locally is so important. Disappointing, I think, for us, besides not uh, taking advantage of the Medicaid expansion is, uh, as you know, Texas decided not to uh, run its own exchange in the marketplace, which folks will start to begin to be enrolled uh, October 1st for coverage that starts in January. Um, we are I'm going to be under the federal exchange, and as such, we do have a limited number of navigator grants that came to our communities. And uh, really working with those folks that got the grants. But what I'm seeing is uh, so many grassroots organizations, business organizations, uh, healthcare groups, uh, not-for-profit grassroots that are so concerned that our state did not take advantage of, of what was, I think, the good points of the Affordable Care Act, that they themselves have formed these great coalitions. Um, and, and I was speaking to a legislator that really, you know, their state took advantage of everything, and their state is doing the exchange, and they're doing it. And they're, they're worried because they don't see the grassroots type of, of uh, involvement. I think because of our lack of the, our state government um, becoming engaged in this, Folks are really going to get out there in the local communities. I mean, they're already knocking on doors mm -hmm. in, in, in communities in Texas trying to explain to people. And, and you really have to explain it in, in real simple terms because there is a lot of controversy, a lot of misinformation. And so the way that I always start out when folks ask me uh, whether I'm at the pharmacy or at the grocery store about the Affordable Care Act is I say, do you believe that every family ought to have a family doctor? And if they say yes, and I say, well, then you're going to love the Affordable Care Act. Now, if you don't believe that every family in this country deserves a family doctor, you're not going to like it at all. But once they understand that and understand our situation here in Texas, um, they are ready to, to try to, to seek a way to get coverage for their family. It's having to go through the different portals. It's not knowing. And it's, and it's really what they see and hear about the controversy, not understanding that part of it, only a very little part of it, was turned down by the, uh, the Supreme Court, and that the, the working ability of the tenants of the act are really going to have to come, at least in our state, with the very local communities and grassroots in the federal government. Because the state has basically abdicated its role, its responsibility, and I think uh, it was a in great error but uh, it is what it is in politics, and so it's up to our local communities and to the folks who really understand how beneficial it could be for our Latino families to be able for the first time to enroll and get a healthcare product uh, at a reasonable rate that, that protects their family. Yeah. And as Senator Van Der Pute and Dr. Lopez have said, it needs to be in a culturally appropriate and culturally relevant way. It needs to be easy to understand, and it is gonna take this door-to-door -door approach to, to make it happen. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of the focus in our previous legislative sessions has been about reducing the cost of our Medicaid program, not expanding it, and they're talking about, you know, fraud prevention and things like that, which, you know, there are some impressions of our Medicaid program in this state that certain lawmakers have um, that guide their decisions on these issues, particularly entitlement programs. I mean, can you guys speak to the utility of what these programs are actually used for and kind of, you know, the way in which they might be misrepresented in some cases or... Uh, in, in my prior role, prior to joining Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, I was the program director and medical director for the Texas Medicaid Wellness Program. So I had an opportunity to be all across the state uh, in both doctor's offices and in patients' homes. Um, I did not see any fraud uh, when I was across the state. The people that we visited uh, needed to be on Medicaid and needed to have the resources that uh, we were providing through that program. Um, I, I, can't, I, I can't comment on, on what the legislators may think about Medicaid. I can only comment about my experience within the program and those folks who have, uh, I dealt with uh, truly needed it. From a Latino perspective, 
50% of Latino children across the country are on CHIP or Medicaid. It's a huge percentage, so it's a very important aspect of how folks in the Latino community receive care. I think a lot of it is just <clears throat> perception. At least uh, when I visit with my colleagues, it's, well, they're gaming the system. And I'll give you a real example that happened here in San Antonio. I was with my sister. My sister and her husband have adopted six children. I mean, from at, at Child Protective Services. Um, those adopted children have health care under the Medicaid program. Uh, my sister uh, and her husband uh, do okay. My sister left her job and is a full-time mom, uh, adopting these six kids. One is a four set uh, siblings. I went with her to the doctor checkup, and my sister drives a big suburban. I mean, you have to with that many kids. And, you know, they're, they're okay financially. He's a preacher at one of the mega churches here. We were leaving the doctor's office, and a person came up and said, I'm going to report you. Look, you're driving that car, and you're having that purse, and, you, and you, I saw you. You had Medicaid. How horrible for the children to witness that. They have Medicaid because it's the policy of our state that we want to encourage people to adopt. And if they would have to be responsible for all the health care, I just quickly got the kids in the car. And my sister was just in tears. You never know people's circumstances. And I think it's just perception. But unless people understand that adopted children are still on Medicaid and people in the foster care system are on Medicaid, they have this perception because they saw her driving this big car. That's what's wrong. You don't know people's situation. And what would we do without good people in this state <coughs> adopting children in our foster care? I was, I was livid and angry, but I didn't want to open my mouth because I thought I don't need to traumatize the children anymore. <laughs> but I think it's things like that, and then they call their legislators. I just saw somebody with this, and I just saw somebody at, using food stamps. And maybe it is that perception. So what I believe is that when you really need to focus on those very few either practitioners, providers in the system that may be gaming the system. But we've got algorithms in our payment uh, logs now that they can really identify somebody who's seeing too many patients a day or they're billing abnormal. I mean, you know that. They should go after that and, and really investigate rather than spend the millions that we're spending now just to placate this perception of, oh, well, there's so much fraud in the system. I believe, like Dr. Lopez, there really isn't. There is a few because, I mean, human nature is what it is, and in any yeah. industry you're going to have uh, some bad players. Go after them. We can really do that in a very focused way rather than put it on the whole population. Um, I think we work if we just work smarter instead of uh, the way that we're doing now, we've thrown out the broad nets with a, a gotcha mentality, particularly for our providers. Um, it, it would be a much more effective system. One of the reasons, I mean, children with SSI benefits uh, receive Medicaid. Right. Um, and they do that because they would max out their insurance otherwise. And so they would exceed their, their yearly uh, maximum or their lifetime maximum. So that's another population that uh, receives Medicaid. And those parents may be very affluent. So since, you know, Texas isn't taking advantage of the Affordable Care Act in the way that you guys have been talking about by expanding Medicaid, um, you know, adults under the 100% of the federal poverty line won't qualify any for insurance under that law. Um, so, you know, what do other organizations in the healthcare community need to be doing, or what are they doing already to change the way that we pay for care for the uninsured, or to improve the way that people can access care for the Latino community? I think from an insurance standpoint, it's important to provide plans that are affordable uh, at all ranges of the spectrum. So I know from Blue Cross Blue Shield perspective, that's one of the things that we're doing. Um, in addition, there still remains the, the safety nets that are here in the state. Um, I, I believe Senator Vandy if you can speak more to that. Well, our safety net has always been, um, and, and our health care providers here and our policy wonks know when we say dish payments, they're disproportionate share um, payments to hospitals uh, for uncompensated care. Uh, the federal government, uh, which sends these, was putting those on the decline. 
and rightly so because under the Affordable Care Act, there'd be no need for a lot of uncompensated care when, when people are covered. Well, in states particular that, uh, like ours, that didn't take advantage of that expansion, uh, those dish payments are reducing to hospitals. Meanwhile, the payments that we thought would happen because this population of, well, we at least know, a million were supposed to be covered by the Medicaid expansion are not. So there is a disconnect because of, of the way the law was written, but mainly because of the poor policy decisions from the state. That was the safety net for a lot of the hospitals. As for the safety net in our communities, our federally qualified healthcare clinics, our not-for-profit healthcare clinics, particularly in San Antonio in our area here, uh, Bear County Hospital District, rather than have folks come to the hospital, they really have done something extremely sensible over the last 15 years, which is to put the primary care clinics out in different quadrants of the community. Therefore, doing that primary care to folks, and, and they've got some stuff on a sliding scale, so that way they don't show up at the ER. Um, those are the types of things. It's, it's our local communities, our local faith-based groups that really have filled this hole uh, for the safety net. They can't continue to do it. Right. They cannot continue to do it. Uh, more and more often, we see these providers that have been working in their communities have to shut their doors. And uh, without, I think, the expansion, without that coverage and with the reduced payments, uh, folks, I think we're headed for a real crisis unless we figure out in the next two to three years how to mesh our state policy differences with what the federal law is and our reimbursement systems. Yeah, I, I, I support that 100%. Well, I, I kind of call it the, the quilt that's kind of frail. You know, we've been doing pretty good, but it's going to tear pretty soon uh, because the, the, you know, the type of, of support systems that we have are stretched to, to the max. And the number of people that continue to need more, uh, more health care and more catastrophic care, you know, it's once you're diagnosed with cancer, it's just not the treatments, it's the recovery, it's your quality of life and how to get back into the work settings and so forth. So the, we have a, a lot of number of issues from prevention all the way through survivorship that we need to be looking at. Yeah, so um, you, you were talking about navig like navigators um, that help people go through the system. Um, you know, Texas is, is kind of trying to innovate in this arena with the 1115 waiver, which is a grant that we've gotten from the federal government to set up some different innovative programs um, in the way that we deliver care. Uh, do you guys have any examples of the way in which hospitals or clinics are really changing up the way that they um, guide patients or help them access care? For, you know, that we might look towards as future examples? Right. Well, uh, we have certainly have found in some of the research studies that we've done that um, if you have a patient navigator in a healthcare, in a cancer center, you can reduce the time from the time of diagnosis to get them in, into timely treatment and then follow up. And, and it's really been critical, again, to cover those holes where, if, particularly if they didn't have health insurance. They were bilingual, as mentioned earlier. They were very, they come from the community, they understand the community, and to really help them to go through the systems. I think San Antonio, we're really proud, just got two uh, 1115 waivers dealing with uh, diabetes uh, education and prevention. So uh, Dr. Schenkler is here from the um, Health Department, Metropolitan Health Department. So we're really excited about those two new initiatives coming to San Antonio. Okay, so and what are those going to be doing in terms of, you know, trying to change the way that we do outreach or prevention for diabetes? Correct. And, and educating them, bringing them in for prevention, getting them connected with their clinics, having a home-based uh, site where they can get the care that they need. I think one of the most promising things, uh, and this was actually something that the state supported, okay, let me repeat that, this is something actually that the state supported, was um, for newborns and for particularly for new parents, uh, the type of follow-up after they leave the hospital, uh, particularly for what they would deem at risk, um, young moms, uh, women uh, who are, are not married. Um, folks who are under a certain indicator of poverty. They may not make it on the Medicaid, or they may be on Medicaid, but let's face it, they're going to be cut off in 60 days postpartum. Uh, those types of programs where you have that home visitation, I think is using that navigator, the promotora, that source of information uh, to our families. And I think it, it has shown great 
success um, when we've had those programs. And I think one of those, I, I think, is, is absolutely great and a wonderful decision. But what, what I think people are not focusing on is given our poverty stats, given our uh, disparity, and, and this was even before the obesity about our rates uh, of, of diabetes prevalence. I mean, this happened before the obesity epidemic. It's not just obesity. It certainly has been complicated by that. But I don't think there's been enough focus on the Latino family health resiliency. There are so many things. I mean, if you look at some of the indicators and where they are, they should be doing way more. What we should focus on, besides trying to alleviate some of the comorbidities, I mean, there are some great health statistics that we have, that why we're so resilient. Um, you know, even if Latinas don't get as much prenatal care, we tend to have healthier babies. That's resilience. Something's happening within the family. Those are the things that we also need to concentrate on as we build this Latino health. And, and when you think about it, how important is it to Latinos to have health? In other cultures and stuff, when you do a brindis, a toast, cheers. Ours, salud. salud. The health is the most important thing that you value. Besides your family and your faith, it's salud. It, it is the basis of, of what represents that family unity and the ability to succeed. Um, but if you are in a system and you live in a neighborhood and you have a job that doesn't offer you the ability to have health insurance, then you're left with the maze of trying to go to this place over here to get this little service or this little place to get this service. And I can tell you how really important it is for women. San Fernando Cathedral has a health fair every year here in San Antonio. They have a mammography machine. There are women that line up at 5 a.m. just to be able to get that mammogram. There are 60 women in line, really almost at, at, at sunrise, because that's the only place that they know they're going to be able to get a free mammogram. That tells you something uh, about the need for this comprehensive type of care. I mean, McAllen, for example, down in the Rio Grande Valley, got a lot of national attention because Although they're one of the most obese cities in the nation, they're also one of the happiest. Um, and that speaks to you know what you were saying about how family and culture plays into <laughs> health outcomes. What are some of the lessons that Texas should you know, bring in as, as they become a majority Hispanic state um, and incorporate into our healthcare system that might improve care for many people? I think one of the things we, we tend to, as you mentioned earlier, um, is, is that we, we criticize our diet a lot, and, it, and it's really not so much our, the diet, it's, it's the proportions that we eat and so forth. And I think San Antonio has a great opportunity of working with the Culinary Institute of the Americas here, who are focusing on Latin foods, and how to promote the good side, as Dr. Van Der Poot was saying, because we, we need to really focus on what is good. And we have a program called Salud America that's focusing on reversing uh, Latino childhood obesity, and we're really trying to promote what are people doing in the communities that's the right thing, and how they're making it, and focusing on the positive things that are going across our nation so that other communities can replicate them as well. But it is that resiliency of the family, of coming together in that unity. But it's being bombarded by unhealthy marketing. You know, we have more billboards in our Latino communities than we do in non-Hispanic whites that are promoting unhealthy foods. We have uh, fewer uh, food deserts, as we were saying. We have more food deserts there. We have our corner stores that aren't offering fresh fruits and vegetables. We have fewer grocery stores that do offer the positive things. So we need to bring this into our community. And it's going to take a huge community effort to make that happen. But, but we can make it. I always say the farmer's markets, for example, we have some of the best produce here in South Texas. Why don't we have more farmer's markets? That was also one of the key things that made a, a healthy city was the amount of farmer's markets they have. And I said, well, you've just got to be careful that when we buy our bananas at the farmer's market, they may ripe by the time you get them into the car because of the heat here. But, but you know, we, we do need to think of different ways of, of making those produce available to, to our families. From the insurance side, is there anything that you know, the state could be doing to change the way um, once someone has insurance or whether, you know, they try and get it to incorporate some of these social. Well, I, as I mentioned earlier, what we're doing is, is really focusing on the Latino community in a holistic way. 
So making sure that we're addressing Latinos, not just as individuals, but we recognize that it's a family unit that is so important. And when you address the Latino member, you're addressing the Latino family. And so um, uh, to uh, both uh, Senator Vanderbilt and Dr. Ramirez's points, um, you have to think of, of Latino health not just individually, but how the decisions are made within the family, how food is cooked in the family, uh, what safety issues folks may worry about. And uh, additionally, the, the issue is so much larger than, you know, is there grocery stores in the neighborhood or is it cheaper to go to a fast food place uh, and get uh, and feed the family uh, uh, for a more affordable price than to buy fruits and vegetables? And those are some of the challenges that our communities face. But from an insurance perspective, making sure that our programs are in place that aren't just bilingual. I mean, you can put a pamphlet out in Spanish, but that that bilingual pamphlet or that person on the phone knows how to address the Latino community in a culturally sensitive way. I think one of the things that is extremely important that we have not touched on is school health policy. Uh, our children uh, are in uh, the schools really for a much longer time and closer to that environment than they are at home. Uh, the school nutrition lunch program, and now, thanks to my colleague, uh, Senator Eddie Lucio, all of the, the school lunch programs will also now have the benefit of the breakfast programs. Those types of programs where you have a nutritious breakfast, you have a nutritious lunch, and the school policies with regard to physical activity and PE and uh, what we call the walking school bus, rather than a school bus that picks the kids up, to have an organized policy where parents or grandparents have this walking bus that picks up kids along the way to promote physical activity. But I'm gonna tell you, I fought, uh, along with my uh, colleague in the Senate, Jay Nelson, when the new curriculums were gonna be adopted this past year, that we're gonna eliminate the PE requirement in high school. And we said, absolutely mm -hmm. not. Have you seen our rates? So I think our schools, and particularly we know that people live in communities, our school districts who are primarily Title I, who have primarily Latino students, their school health advisory councils, which every school uh, district has, can play an important role in promoting policies that are at the school level that will really help the overall health, not just of the Latino children, but of, of the whole families that surround that. For our communities, uh, Latino communities define themselves by their schools and by their high schools, right? That, that's how kind of we define ourselves, that and our churches. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's what I'm about to say. And, yeah. and, and so that's what's really, really important is those school board trustees, the, the decision making at that level, I think could add greatly. Maybe not in the state's purview, but certainly mm -hmm. under the decision making processes for local elected officials city, county, but particularly Correct. the schools. Yeah. I think we need to increase you know, our active play places. We need more parks and recreations, but we need shared agreements with schools to let their communities utilize some of, you know, instead of big, having these big fences, you know, coming up with opportunities for them to utilize it. And, and as you're saying, just better foods in our schools, uh, reducing the vending machines and things like that, and reducing the, the sugary drinks. We need to encourage just water consumptions in our communities, because uh, our two-year-olds, about 75% of our two-year-olds have already had a, a sugar beverage, you know, by the time they're two. And, so. and it costs. Mm -hmm. uh, the other night I was driving by Edison High School, uh, they put in lights. It was 9 o'clock. You couldn't get into the parking lot. There were literally probably about 100 people walking the track. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful for the community, but the decision by the school board to actually have the lights on at night, because uh, who's going to walk in 100 degree weather uh, during right. the middle of the day? That community is utilizing mm -hmm. that track. Those are the type of decisions. And, and like I said, I couldn't even get into the parking lot. Yeah, and our mayor's fitness council here is be really being very active and changing things around in San Antonio to make a lot of these things happen. So we're really uh, fortunate to have that. Okay, well, um, I think we're going to open it up now to some questions from the audience. Um, so if anyone has anything they'd like to ask, please step up to or raise your hand. We'll bring you a mic. Uh, my name is Mufa Cantu, and I'm a, a community ambassador for the National Psoriasis Foundation. It's very good to say about our Latino community when people don't have psoriasis, okay? We have kids, we have elderly. I have psoriasis, 
I've had a stroke. We don't talk about the core mobilities and psoriasis. One of the things you don't talk about is people with psoriasis because we're contagious, we're, you know, we're mangy, that's what they call us. It's, it, we're, uh, what is it, uh, leprosos, you know, and we're not, we're not treated in our communities, not even in any place, as human beings. We're treated as people that shouldn't be here. Even the medical community. If we have core mobilities, like cardiovascular, obesity, and you were talking about obesity, people with psoriasis have a higher incidence. We have a higher risk of developing all these illnesses, but nobody cares about us. When we want to talk about it, when we say, you know, we're not contagious, people look at us like, you're not supposed to be here. I walked into a restaurant one time and they said, I don't know why they let her in here. She shouldn't be, she should be outside. Children are treated that way in school. They're bullied in school. I have a child, I have a support group. It's called Nuevo Amanecer Bilingual Psoriasis Group. It's the first bilingual in the nation. And nobody knows about it because nobody cares about psoriasis. Even though we're treated as the lowest of the low. And for an illness that has been around 4,000 years, nothing has been done about it. Yes, I would like to ask, what can, are you going to help us? How are, are you going to help us to bring about better understanding of this illness? I think one of the problems is uh, with the Latino community, but with that's it's not just the Latino community, is that we tend to focus on those diseases or lifelong conditions that affect majority of the population, the diabetes, the high blood pressure. Um, and in, for diseases that are not, uh, have that high prevalence. Uh, one that is getting, I think, and that ties into what, what you have mentioned with the psoriasis, is the high incidence of lupus uh, and the growing, and particularly in Latinas. There, I think there's been a lot of work on that, because I would say uh, where you are right now with your group, and, and thank goodness, this is empowering to have people at the grassroots say, hey, wait a minute, there's this condition as well. Um, that's what happened with lupus, uh, and, the, and really the support groups for that. Uh, there has been, as you know, some of the, the, uh, the, the, the types of things with psoriasis, with lupus, because it's all autoimmune. But I think it's not purposefully somebody sets out to discriminate. It's the lack of information, and it's the fear. I mean, remember how communities responded to, you know, 25 years ago to the first AIDS patients uh, and uh, children who were HIV positive in public schools. Uh, I mean, think, think about it. So I congratulate you for your work. And yes, we do need to do some work on those. But I think what happens is that our policies tend to focus on those that affect the higher number. And uh, we don't want psoriasis to affect. But let me tell you, uh, my dad, my sister, my cousin, you know, because it, it, it is an autoimmune. Uh, and they have suffered as well. And, and because of that, I, I used to watch my dad in 100 degree weather wear long sleeve shirts because he didn't want to be embarrassed and he didn't want to embarrass us when we would go into a restaurant. First of all, I'd like to thank the panel. Uh, as a Latino, I'm very proud to see Latino leadership uh, elected people doing research and practitioners. Uh, my question is to this, uh, having heard what you say, what do you need from the community so that we can have informed policy and leadership like yours and informed practice uh, so that we can continue on the pathway of the kind of change that the Affordable Care Act is if I may, one of the things that I'd love to see and I am seeing in the community is local leadership. Uh, having community leaders uh, get behind uh, the Affordable Care Act in terms of providing information to the folks that they, in the communities that they live in. Um, that is so important to me and from, a, from as a physician and as a practitioner, promoting health within the community promoting uh, uh, going to the doctor and getting your preventative services, uh, not just when you feel 
uh, unwell or when you feel sick, but when you feel well to make sure that you can find those conditions at an early stage and, and treat them appropriately. And uh, Latinos get information about their health, often from other Latinos in the community, from tios and tias and from cousins and from mom and dad, and making sure that we start creating this grassroots movement for health within the Latino community, both from the Affordable Care Act uh, perspective, getting information out uh, to make sure that folks are getting uh, the insurance that they need, but also promoting health within the community is so very important. And I'd just like to echo that, that we need to advocate within our members to be after city council and other uh, political leaders for this change. You know, as here in San Antonio, we need more bike lanes. We, you know, we, we need to involve planning and other groups. It's just not one group of individuals, but it takes the whole community, the community, community leaders, and the healthcare system to, you know, to have this change uh, occur. And, uh, and we really need to continue pushing that. We need our parents and the PTAs to say, we want better foods in schools. We want to get you know, rid of those sugary drinks, you know, those kinds of things in order to, to have that change occur. I'm not going to be as diplomatic as these two great <laughs> doctors here. I'm going to use a four-letter word, vote. Until, and I'm, I'm speaking at the state level, um, the power of the Latinos is not reflected in uh, their voting patterns. Um, and this is not just, I'm not talking South Texas, but uh, the, we need to do more for registration and outreach. Um, but when Latinos are active at the ballot box and they vote for people who make decisions that will make decisions in the best interest of their communities, then state policy will change. Great. I never think that's one down here. I just realized something very important. I'm from Mexico. None of my relatives in Mexico ever had dental issues. Okay, you don't know. I don't know why. I had insurance, but I never used it. The Instituto Mexicano de Seguro Social. I think that culture has come in the U.S. with the Mexican uh, come from Mexico first, second generation. My daughter works in Austin. She's a nurse practitioner, and she works on those new clinics. And she's telling me that not only there's no prevention, no aparecen hasta que no les duele. There's and I do the same. No voy al dentista hasta que me duele la muela. So that's in serio, that's the truth. You you think that because it doesn't hurt, everything is going work going well like a car. That's that's a philosophy. So that is very dangerous. I started to take care of myself really after I had the second child. I really I thought I am the one being not in person can do as well, so why? Well I'm pre diabetic now, but I'm about to take care of that too because I understand now the power. The doctor told me this is one of the illnesses that you can stop, but it takes mm -hmm. a lot of work and you have, and that's the problem. My sister, my daughter sees patients 30 a day, 30, 15 minutes each, that's all she's allowed. And with extreme cases, anything comes in there through that door. And denial is the first thing that she has to deal with. She sees newlyborns and 80 year olds from cancer to malnutrition, whatever, and she says, mom, I'm speaking Spanish and explaining, well, you're a doctor, you know, and there's total denial. No, señorita, yo comí nada más este pollito hervido con verduras. I just have steamed chicken with, with uh, vegetables the last month or so, and they are like, but you gained 100 pounds, what, how can that be? <laughs> so, did you take your medication? For un ratito, just for a little bit, because I started feeling well right away. So, even if they are very sick, they don't take their medication. There's a lot of medication, but you said something very important. I didn't, I didn't think about this when I came here today, but I, we are a subject, you know, of something very special, which is no prevention, denial, and then immediate cure with one bottle of medication. And then we don't come back. And then when we come back, it's 10 times worse and it's more costly. So education, but constant, 
you know, understanding the culture, explaining the results. The other day I thought maybe we need to take pictures of the cancer patients that have lost limbs and etc. Just like they did with the cigarettes and show, this is the way you are today and this is the way you're going to be if you don't take care of yourself. I finally was struck with that, you know, a slap on my face that something is wrong, I'm busy, I cannot breathe well, and sometimes my, I have very, you know, eyes. Can you do that for me to go to? And I think I'm an educated, I have the means, I have insurance, and I fell into the same room. So imagine what happens when you don't have the means of education or money. So there's a lot of work in front of us because of our culture that we bring in, you know, in Chile. So, it's very well said, um, and we, we confront that every single day. You know, we, we, we hear that, why, they, why individuals have, didn't come in or why they end up in the emergency room. And it is going to take this constant level of public education and information that's culturally relevant to get our community to begin to change. You know, by 2050, one in three individuals, are, uh, children, are going to be Latinos. If we don't stop childhood obesity today, they're, gonna not, they're not going to outlive their parents. And they're, going, and they're going to live, if they do, they're going, to, they're going to have poor quality of life. And whose responsibility is that? But it's, it's all our community. We all have to be together. If it's hard to go out and exercise, you're not going to do it. If you, know, you, if you don't have the support groups to kind of motivate you, you're not going to do it. So we really need to change our perception of how we want to build a healthier community. And it's, it's having more green spaces, feeling safe when you're outside, having more access to fresh fruits and vegetables are some of the key things that research is showing that we can change and we need to change. We're 16% of the population of the United States. We account for about 9% of the healthcare expenditures. So we utilize healthcare services less than any other population uh, by percentage. Um, those are things that we face as, as a physician. I understand that. I understand when uh, Senora Ramirez comes in to see me that she's going to have all this baggage around her in terms of what her health, what her perceptions of care are. And I have that because I'm Latino and I understand it and my parents are from Mexico. Uh, but you're exactly correct. I, I would start my office practice at 7.30, work through lunch, and not leave uh, until late at night, seeing patients beyond my time frame, because it you require that intensive education, and everyone in your staff has to educate the folks. So we do face challenges from a cultural perspective that go down the generations. A close family member of mine born in the United States, similar to me, um, went to the doctor for a preventative visit, uh, was found to be uh, profoundly anemic, hadn't seen a doctor in about four or five years. And she's like, Esteban, but you know, I felt great. And they found all these problems. And I said, the problems were there. You were just compensating for them. So so good that you went in and saw someone, found them early, and got the treatment that you needed to prevent something worse in the future. And so um, these are some challenges. And they're very real challenges. And that is why having more culturally competent providers in the community is so very important. And part of it is because of our lack of uh, access to health insurance, because of policies, other organizations and other sectors really have taken up the slack. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk about things like you wouldn't think that the housing authority, and I know we've got a little of this here, are housing authorities uh, that have folks who are in poverty, who uh, are struggling. Uh, it is important for us to partner with the housing authority, with the utility companies, with the, to, to put the message de salud, the, to, to health. And particularly, I'm going to, to I, I always ask women to form those friendships uh, la amistad, nuestras hermanas, to ask them, have you gone for your yearly exam? Especially when you see our alarming rates of cervical cancer. And that, and, and then find out why. Oh, why you, well, it, it, find, have the resources. There are some places that you can. Uh, getting, of course, more scarce with the women's health program uh, and the obliviation, I think, of it, even though we tried to put in some more money with it. And even now, uh, with 
what happens is sometimes our healthcare providers get in the crosshairs uh, of a, an unintended consequence. For example, the, the issue of, of termination of pregnancy and abortions, really to exclude Planned Parenthood clinics when the majority of stuff that goes on at the clinics is your pap smear and your family planning, and they're closing. Closing because of something political. And it, but what's going to happen to the hundreds of thousands of women who don't have health care insurance that now, that, that was their only source of low-cost um, annual pap smears. So sometimes those health care policies in, in other parts of the state or city or the, really impact particularly how women access their own health care. And folks, I think we're going to be at a crisis point for this. You, you, you triple the, what, no Medicaid expansion, uh, the destruction, I think, of our women's health care program, uh, the ancillary shots at Planned Parenthood, where are women going to go in this state? Particularly women who are of limited means and women in the rural areas. I mean, very, very difficult for our world. And where do Latinos live? They live in the city, but huge amounts live in the rural areas. Um, not, nothing has really been said uh, about that. Um, I think we really are going to have to look comprehensively at that. And maybe it's going to take those folks that we rely on, the researchers and the statisticians. We need good, credible data. We need that research. And we need best practices on what works with limited resources, um, how best to affect the outcomes of the uh, health of our families uh, and, and, and copy from other cities and other jurisdictions that may have a very innovative program that produces results. Uh, my question is more of nuts and bolts, concrete type question. Uh, and I applaud your attention to being culturally competent, the use of promotoras, trusted advocates, et cetera. Uh, but I recently heard in a, in a presentation such as this that the enrollment form is pretty egregious, that it's difficult, uh, they likened it to a FAFSA form, uh, and that it has tax uh, implications. And, you know, we're right around the corner from October 1, and I haven't seen this form. What can we do to mobilize the promotors that we use in our community uh, to become familiar with this form and to, and to be efficient and effective in getting it out to the community? Uh, and I'm really asking, is, is the form in fact egregious? And is there anything we can do to, uh, to make it less so? The form will have a lot of information that's required. I think things that folks have to do to prepare for it is get their, know what information they require. So that's why they come to BeCoveredTexas.org. It will help prepare them for October 1st. Um, much has been spoken about uh, the Navigators, and it's great to have a Navigator grant uh, here in San Antonio to have Navigators, but I don't think that's the end all. You have a variety of different resources. Uh, the Navigators are one part of it. Other community organizations are going to be part of it, and our population will need some level of, quote, navigation to get through the process. And the part that we haven't talked about are insurance agents and brokers. They're going to be a, a big part of this as well. And those folks can help individuals uh, sign up uh, for health insurance. So I think it's going to be a larger group of folks. I don't know that we're going to be able to change the form at this point. I mean, that's a federal issue. But dealing with the form that is in place and making sure folks have the information, their financial information beforehand, uh, and work through the process with all the resources that will be available in the city. Good morning. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this uh, forum. Um, you know, it's, it's very um, enlightening and uh, very good information. You know, I think one, one of the things that I just wanted to share with, um, with the panel and, and those in the room is that, you know, for us as um, housing providers, you know, as a housing authority, um, health is, you know, a very, um, health access and access to quality health is, is extremely important uh, for the families that we serve. Um, just uh, this week, uh, there was a report um, issued um, from the Institute for Children, uh, Poverty, and Homelessness. The report, you know, basically says that there are numerous risk factors that lead to homelessness that low-income families face, 
Among them, of course, you know, family instability, um, employment or underemployment, and health, uh, health concerns, lack of access to health, was among um, really the, the, the more significant indicator. So, you know, I think it speaks to, you know, why it's important for different groups to be involved. Um, it, you know, becomes a vicious cycle. If families don't have access to quality health, um, it affects their ability to, um, you know, to be able to work or to get to work. It affects their ability to take care of their children. And if we really want to, you know, break the cycle of poverty, I think we need to look at this comprehensively. So, you know, so I, really I think my, my question is, I know that we're, we're all trying to step up and do um, more to, um, to ensure that the, the information gets to the, the, the families that we're serving. Um, but I do agree that I guess it, it, it's really a, um, a policy question and it's, it's, a, it's a question of, of what are the priorities for our, our, um, for our leaders, right, and, and you know, for, for our state. Um, so, I, so I guess my question is what more can we do beyond, you know, stepping up and trying to get information out and raising awareness? Is there anything else that we, you know, we can do um, within our communities um, to uh, to bring um, more attention to to this issue, I'll I'll, tr I'll try to answer it. I, I think um, having been involved uh, as a pharmacist as a policymaker, um, the coalition of groups that have come together because the states not do anything on the rollout of the exchanges has really led to the type of discussions with folks uh, that never got around the same table before. Uh, and I'm really pleased to see that, and I understand that's happening in other communities as well. But I think it's using every opportunity that we have in whatever we do. And I see people in the education community, in the business community, it is really a, an enlightened self-interest for our business community mm -hmm. to understand what it would mean for them if their employees, particularly the employees that have the lower end salaries, to be able to, uh, to, to purchase a low-cost uh, plan um, on the market. Uh, it is really, really important to use every interface as that opening for the discussion, for knowledge. Uh, I think that it, it, it's going to be tough. It is complicated. Um, it's a lot of change in uh, just a very short time, and it's made more difficult by the controversies. I mean, when you have state uh, leadership and leadership that says their whole focus is shutting down Obamacare, even at, at the expense of shutting down the federal government, then that sends a very strong message to folks uh, about how much they dislike it. What I keep trying to tell people in the Medicaid expansion and in everything is that I hope that the leadership in my state would come to a place where my local community is already, and that's that they love the people who live in their communities more than they dislike this president or the, or, or the, or the Affordable Care Act, and to take the good parts of it and make it work. Understand that any complex law is going to need the tweaking. Every law has uh, its unintended consequences. So for us, to be able to get out the right information, sometimes we need the right information, right? Uh, it's a very complex law. It's been made more difficult by the controversy. But everyone, whatever sector you're in, to use that as an opportunity uh, to interface with folks that may not know. And then we've got to know who to direct them to. Uh, we just had a, a, a kind of an issue here, is that our 211 hotline, United Way, you know, they were first at told that they couldn't help give out information about the exchanges. Okay, this is the United Way helpline when people call. And now we're trying to get the clarification that the state, because they get state funds and we didn't want to help with the, the rollout of the, of the exchange. We're not helping, but we've got to be able to at least give somebody a phone number, an address of a place that they can get the information, right? So my anger was, not only does the state not want to implement it, but they don't want anybody using state dollars to even give information about it. I mean, how much do you hate the people that live in this state? I mean, come on, get over it. It is absolutely about the health of the community. 
And that's what I hope we focus on uh, and every opportunity that you can do, and particularly people here who are thought leaders, who are on boards and commissions, please bring it up. One big opportunity that we have that we have not used that I think is in our coalition here is our faith-based communities. If Latinos are, or anything, they are connected to their church. They are connected to their faith-based organizations. Uh, either that or their mother is. <laughs> uh, and that's a great source to, to get out that information. If I can add one, one more thing to that. You know, the, the title of our talk today was The Future of Latino Health. And we painted a picture that seems a little bit grim. But I have to believe that the future of Latino health is positive. I mean, we have these forms in place here today. And to your point, it's, it's such a larger issue. Um, it, it is a policy issue. It is a citywide issue. It is a regional issue. Uh, and I recently uh, worked with a group at uh, Leadership San Antonio. We were talking about diabetes. And I think that folks need to understand we're 60 some percent of this county. You know, 60% of Bear County are, are, are Latinos. Um, and it, if we don't address the future of Latino health, it is to our own demise. Why? Because businesses won't come to San Antonio or to South Texas if their population is unhealthy. Uh, there won't be tax revenue for the city or for the county. It's such a big, big issue that it is in all of our interest as Latinos and non-Latinos to make sure that we're addressing the issue of Latino health because it permeates all aspects of our society from how our streets get paved and what revenues we have for the airport and how businesses uh, get attracted to the city. You know, Toyota thought twice about coming to San Antonio uh, because they saw the demographics. Uh, and we have to change our demographics for our own survival for, for this part of the state. And I think it is in the interest of every Latino and non-Latino in Bear County and in South Texas to make sure that we're creating that change. So I have to believe that the future of Latino health is positive. But in order to address the future, we have to understand what the present is and what the past is. Uh, so a new medical school in the Rio Grande Valley, that's a positive thing for Latino health. We will have more Latino doctors. And we will start addressing some of these issues. And every step that we take along that path, uh, either in this forum or everyone in the audience, is, is going to help make the future even brighter. And we need, we need your voice. We, we need to really advocate for these issues. And as Seven was just saying, it's just not about health, but it's education. We still have one of the highest dropout rates here in South Texas. We need to change that if we really want to be competitive in the future. So bringing those things. And we also need to value, as uh, Senator Vanderpeet was saying, that every life should be valued and that we really need to work hard. But it's, it's a whole advocacy uh, effort. To be, we can't be silent anymore. Many times I'm on national committees in Washington and I'm going like, where are the other Latinos here in this board? You know, we, we need more representations at all of these levels to reinforce what we're saying. And I'm going, what makes us different? Because I was here many years ago when we only represented 6% of the U.S. population. And as Stevan said, we are 16% and we're still not considered the majority population. You go, I mean, they'll say it, but they don't believe it. You know, so how are we going to create this change? And it's only by, by hearing our voices and hearing about our needs that is really critical. Well, I just want to thank everyone for coming out and being here today. Um, on that note, I think you know, we're going to continue this conversation, but uh, maybe outside of the panel. Um, thank you all for joining us, and hopefully you can join us again later this month at the festival, and we can keep talking about these important health care issues for our state. Thank you, The Trip, for coming thank to you very much. Yeah. Thank you to thank everyone you. in the thank audience. You